Thank you so much. And thank you to Boswell. Um, I thought I would just read from the selections I'm going to buy tonight. <laughs> so buckle up. OK, here we are, dream team together again. <laughs> uh, Lindsay, do you want to start? I think people sort of know the gist of the, the book based on getting enough information to be here. But like, uh, what's your uh, like elevator pitch? What a terrible question to start with. <laughs> let's let's hear it. I think writers are especially bad at this sometimes. Um, and and we need to get better at it. And um, but that also feels unfair. But anyway, I would say it is um, a book that's based on a real murder that I first heard about listening to um, the audio version of an episode of Dateline NBC, which is hilarious because they don't edit it for audio. They they just they talk about things that are on screen that you can't see and they don't care that you can't see them because they know you're probably going to Google it. Anyway, um, but I was desperate for something to listen to as I was cooking dinner. And that episode, that particular episode was called Secrets on Hot Springs Drive. And um, it was about the murder of a woman's best friend. And um, the, the perpetrator of the murder completely shocked me and I knew I had to write something about it. So uh, would you consider this a novelization of the Dateline episode? No, absolutely not. And I could never achieve that height of art. Um, <clears throat> I can only try. Um, no, absolutely not. I, I listened to that episode once and like the core of what interested me was what I used as I was writing. And I never listened to it again until I had to start doing press for the book. And I started wondering like, what stuff, like what did I get that was real? about what happened and what was like my memory of it and things that I was bending to my will. And there was a lot that I had forgotten, um, <clears throat> like including I got the murder weapon wrong. Um, I got the fact that there were some things that the the woman who I based Jackie on, Jackie's the, um, the main character, um, did some crazy things after the murder to sort of try to get um, suspicion off of her. Um, she's just a delight. I, I encourage all of you to to look into the case. Um, she's truly uh, an interesting person. But not as interesting as the characters in Hot Springs Drive. <laughs> um, so, so the true crime angle, I feel like this is sort of uh, important to the book and the way the book's been presented. I think crime has been an element of your work from the very beginning. Um, but the the examination of like a crime in terms of like how it's perceived, uh, you know, from people Im immediately involved, and then like sort of the the outer rings of people um, witnessing it or like hearing about it, and then into like the media scape. Like to me, that seems to be like um, the crux of the book. So, you know, what what sort of brought you to this idea that you know not just that the book's gonna like center on a murder. But it's not gonna, it's not gonna be in the sense of like a lot of the books, like in the mystery section here, where it's like a who done it or something like that. And even though you know some of that is withheld, like the circumstances of the murder are are withheld to a certain degree through uh, a chunk of the book. Um, what led you to this uh, structure that's not that's sort of threading the needle between like this has elements of like crime and thriller fiction, but it. Um, is more interested in like the human element that you might get in like uh, sprawling literary fiction. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I didn't set out to write a crime novel or a murder novel, and and I, um, I set out to write actually to examine the like a codependent relationship between a mother and her child, and and to sort of try to figure out that relationship and and what was good about it and what was bad about it. And um, so that was my first draft. And I, I was also trying to create this feeling, the same feeling that I had gotten when I heard about this murder, which was um, just sort of like a, a rush of all of the after effects and all of the, you know, the consequences coming at me all at once and trying to see it all. Um, and so I was trying to do that. I think that's why I went for such a fractured structure. It was even more fractured and and it jumped around in time in the original first draft. Um, and then when I was going back and revising it, I it really was like a moment of, I, I never have these moments because I never focus on plot, which is a weakness. Um, 
where I realized like, oh, wow, I have like, I have a plot. <laughs> I have this major event that happened and it's okay to trust that. Cause I, I went to art school and so I'm always trying to complicate things in an arty way. And <clears throat> I wasn't, I, it, it was really a, like a talking to that I had to give myself, which was like, you can trust this major thing that happened. And as a reader, you're gonna have questions and curiosity about this thing that happened. So I can trust that that's there and I can build the rest of the story around it. So it's okay for things to happen chronologically, <laughs> which for me was such a, like a, like I felt, am I, am I a cop out? Like, am I a sellout for going chronological man? which is so silly. It's so silly. And then it, things became so much easier as I went and the story, you know, fell into place. But um, yeah, I didn't set out to, to, to make this my crime novel, but um, I guess it kind of is now. So uh, I'm a Lindsay Hunter fan from way back. Hey. I got Daddy's, your uh, 2010, is that right? Yeah. Debut mm -hmm. from Featherproof Books. It's shaped like a tackle box and you open it like this. One of the rare uh, books you read horizontally. <laughs> so it might be um, something to track down as a collector's item. We originally were going to print each story on a little sheet of paper and roll them up like cigarettes and put them in boxes that looked like old school 1970s cigarette boxes. And that was going to be the book because I guess we didn't want anyone to read the stories ever. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you buy two copies that way, one for the collectability. Smoke them if you got them, right? And then the other one is... Well, you know, display. keep that in your back pocket, maybe for the next book. That's right. Um, but so, so that 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 book um, was uh, like a collection of you know what we call flash fiction. You know, I'm no fan of that particular name for that genre. I, I guess I prefer it like short short fiction, but very short stories, right? Mm -hmm. And to to me, uh. That's even even as you write novels, um, and even in your latest novel, I still see an aspect of like flash fiction or like you know short punchy uh, narrative in your work. Um, so so for instance, like the the opening chapter of the of Hot Springs Drive is kind of like a prologue, and it's from the point of view of like the house itself where where the murder uh, took place, um, and then. You know, even as we check in with like the major players throughout the novel and get their point of view, whether it's Jackie or Teresa or the kids or the husbands, there are also these chapters, and there's some of my favorite chapters in the book that are sort of like bit players or like witnesses who are like what I would call like totally like not even secondary characters, but tertiary characters. And, you know, some of those chapters almost stand as their own as like, oh, this is a great like short story about you know, this weird guy or this high school student. Um, and so I guess, you know, I, it's a long way, way of asking, like, you know, what is it about, like, this sort of, these sort of short, this short propulsive form that you're so drawn to? And, and why, is it, why do you think it's something that sort of you return to even as you're, like, writing holistically uh, longer works? Yeah. Um, well, I'm glad that you pointed that out. Those are some of my favorite um parts of the book as well. And, and I've had a lot of people say that they love Jessica Blender, who's the high school student he mentions. I'm a big uh, Mike Shasta fan. God, Mike Shasta. Oh, Mike Shasta. I know. Where do we think he is now? <laughs> He's doing well, I'm sure. He's fine. Mike Shasta always lands on his feet. Um, yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I think for me, when I was, when I was in grad school, um, I thought that I was going to learn how to write like a capital W writer. And um, and so I kept trying to embody what I thought that looked like, which was um, like uh, just drudging and trudging through a really bad novel that was going nowhere. And I was writing the same scene again and again and again. I didn't know I was writing the same scene again and again and again. Um, what I was really learning to do when I was in grad school was to read, was to learn how to read, was to learn how to look at look at look into books for what I was searching for in terms of my own writing. So it's it was feeding, learning how to read in that way. My advisor saying, I see kind of what you're going for here. Um, you should try reading this author. And and they, have also, they were also endeavoring to do what it seems like you're endeavoring to do. Um, and not in the way that um, you should read this so you know that you could never do it as well, but you should read this because this is your partner in 
in trying to do these things. And that has fed me ever since. And um, so towards the end of graduate school, and I was, I was, you know, reading all these new voices and, and, and honestly getting permission from all these new voices that my advisors were pointing me to. Um, like I remember one of my advisors had me read, um, actually it was for class, uh, Joe Brainerd's I Remember. Have you read that? Yeah, yeah. Every grad student has re read that, right? It's required, yeah. It probably is. But for me, I was like, oh, okay, this guy would, went off. Um, and if you don't know, it's a book that's completely just sentences that start with I remember, and it's just I remember, whatever. Um, so I was getting all these permissions. And anyway, I got to a point at the end of grad school where I realized that I could write the way that I wanted to write. I could try that, and um, so I, I did. I sat down and I, I got fed up and I wrote something that felt really good, and I brought it in and read it, and my advisor had, or my teacher had me read it a few more times, and it was a very, it was actually, it was the first story in Daddy's My Brother, which is um, like a page, <clears throat> and and has no plot, and is more about like um, like impressions and language, and that was the biggest um, epiphany that I'd ever had as a writer was just to write the way that I could. And when I left grad school, I I was working full time and it was a it was a stressful job. And I thought I don't know how I'm going to make sure that I'm still writing because I can feel it slipping away from me. Um, you know, I'm tired <laughs> and it's not paying me. So. Um, this is a long answer to your question. My friend and I started a flash fiction reading series and we told ourselves we'd write a new story for it every single month. And flash fiction I had never written before. And I learned to be completely economical in a very short amount of space. I learned um, about uh, urgency on the page. I learned about how to get um, what I was trying to say out very quickly and efficiently. And um, I wrote two collections of flash fiction, and then I thought, well, it's really bothering me that I don't know for sure that I could write a novel that's not plotting and boring, so I'm going to try. And I have to write it the way that I could write it, which is in a way that <clears throat> preserves the urgency and the fun in it, because if it's there for me, then it'll be there for the reader, hopefully. And that's how I write now. That's like, I, I, I when I'm drafting, I do word count goals, and I give myself a daily word count goal. And when I'm working toward that, then I'm less concerned with whether what I'm writing is good. So I don't have to judge myself in that way. I can just be very quick and efficient. And especially now that I'm a mom, I have to be quick and I have to be way more quick and efficient. That has helped me preserve that energy that you're seeing there. And I think the way that I could write a novel is to make it a bunch of little pieces of flash that I knit together somehow. Okay, I'm curious. So I'm. So when speaking of Hot Springs Drive in particular, like, so when you had like all the pieces together, because I think you sort of alluded uh, a little bit earlier about how like it wasn't always in like linear time. So I guess I'm just curious, obviously not getting too much into detail. We want to avoid spoilers or whatever. But so so what what sort of changed from like the initial like here's all the little pieces and then how it exists in the book? What changed from the original draft to this? Yeah, I guess so. If that's a okay question. Yeah, no, it is. A, it, it's yeah. There was a lot more um, Jackie's rant, ranting in the original draft, and she would go in and out of um, third person and first person, which I thought was so clever. Um, and you know, a year passed until I was revising, and and I looked at it again, and I was like, what is this? Is terrible? You know, like I'm not relating to this at all. So there was a lot of her like invective <clears throat> and um, it wasn't doing what I thought it was doing. And I, again, was like, I, if I'm including the reader in this, if it's a partnership and I'm giving them a little and they're gonna give a little, I have to give them a little. <laughs> so I had to kind of open it up for, the, for readers and, and, um, and find like, uh, other ways to you know show what I was trying to show with Jackie um 
I think that's the main change and, and other, and, you know, making it chronological because before it would sort of, you know, the boys would be little and then all of a sudden they'd be adults, you know, um, Teresa would be dead, she'd be alive. And so I was trying to give you, I was, I was trying to give you the whole picture all at once and you could look at it in any form or shape or um, order that you wanted to and see how it shifted, but it wasn't, it wasn't doing what I needed it to do. So you, uh, you mentioned like the kids, right? So we have kids in this novel and we get their point of view. Uh, Jackie has four and Teresa has one. And there's, there's like that like cliche from Hollywood or whatever, like don't work with animals or kids. <laughs> and to me that, that I think in a lot of ways applies to fiction too, because there's so many like sort of landmines you have to av avoid of like, you don't, if you're doing a kid's perspective or even just a major uh, character in a novel who is like a kid, a kid, it's hard not to like either make them like too precocious or just make them seem like an idiot animal kind of thing. And then on, on top of that to like, even, you know, these are kids that are sort of running around the yard together, like all five of them at times. So on top of that, even to just like put all those kids in a scene together and have them interact and be able to keep track of like their different personalities and nuances um, seems to me like a really tricky thing to do, but also like super important to a novel that's like about motherhood and about the way like these family structures influence everyone in sort of unseen and largely unnoted ways. So like. I guess I just asking generally, like, what what was your approach to um, creating these uh, characters who are like kids or teens, and you know, even, and then on top of that, it's like growing them up. So we also see these kids like as adults um, to a certain degree. So like, you know, how how do you do something like that? It seems way too hard. You shouldn't have tried. <laughs> um. Well, I will say um, I just I'm taking a screenwriting class and I have to write a script and I just started writing a script and there's two kids in it. And I am immediately like, God, why did I do this? You know, because it's yeah. like, why are these kids here? What am I going to use them for? It is it really is a daunting thing. And when I was writing Hot Springs Drive, sometimes I forget about Nathan. And like he's he's the third um, the third boy. And um, I'd be like, oh, yeah, what's he up to? <laughs> I got to remember what Nathan's doing. Um, I think I, as a human, I think about birth order a lot. I'm the middle child of three. And, um, so I, I was thinking about them in terms of birth order and thinking about them the way that my kids, um, when they see that I'm stressed or upset, the way that they react to me, because J Jackie's often stressed and upset and, um, how different the kids, um, react to that, how they be, you know, behave, how they edit their behavior or they amp up their behavior. Um, you know, I was thinking about that and, and thinking about those, the reasons why they would make those choices and, um, you know, and, and what that meant for who they became later on. And it, you know, it, I'm sure in the first draft or two, they all seemed like the same person <laughs> or two of them seemed like, you know, the same and the other two seemed like the same, but um, you know, that's the kind of stuff you, you work on as you go, you know, and you hope, hope for the best. Well, it turned out the best. Oh, uh, yeah. So, th so thinking about Jackie, who's like, you know, in a novel that I think is sort of intentionally eschewing the idea of like a central character, like she's the closest thing to a central character. She's the only character whose point of view we get in the first person. Um, and you, you talked a little bit about that already but um you know i can i can imagine this jackie character on like these dateline kinds of shows and like you know with the contrast turned up to make her look like evil um and so i think the novel is i think really interested in that sort of archetype of like you know not that jackie is necessarily uh you know the murderer in the novel but as someone like implicated in you know this sort of crime that becomes subject matter for like sensationalist um like journalism quote unquote journalism um it's it's risky in a book in a book like this or any book to have a, a character 
that's going to be sort of off-putting to the reader in a certain way. You know, when we see those characters on, like, Dateline without very much depth, we just think, like, oh, she's going to get hers. I can't wait till they bust her. Um, and I, I think the novel really resists a lot of the sort of easy ways that I think many authors would kind of soften that character right away, both in terms of like showing how she interacts with like her, her kids, right? So it's sort of like, oh, she's a bad person, but she did it for her kids or whatever, right? Um, so I'm just curious, like, you know, how, how did you sort of practice that restraint in terms of like letting this character of Jackie be like real and like interesting and someone that we invest in as readers but while I think in a lot of ways, like refusing to soften those hard edges. I tried to, I think Jackie tells the truth, even if it's not true. I think that's one thing I think that I, I wanted her um, to feel like an authentic person and um, to feel like the choices that she makes are not choices that we would necessarily make, but you could see how she got there. Um, and her specifically, not like us. <laughs> um, but I think it is always a risk. And in the first draft, she was very one note rage. You know, because of the choices she makes, she's un unlikable, which I really enjoy. Um, but I think if you if you can trust as the writer as you if you can trust the voice that you're you know that you're using as you're writing um and and you're not um this sounds so like rah rah like woo woo not putting words in her mouth when you literally are putting words in her mouth um I don't know if you can if you can follow the authenticity of the character even if that character is a real shithead um I think it's compelling and I think Jackie like I said I think Jackie believes what she's telling you I think she's honest um even though we see from these other perspectives things that she's not facing so you know one thing I'm interested in good answer by the way I don't know how much positive reinforcement. I, I need a lot. Maybe. Okay, yeah. What brilliant, <laughs> brilliant answer? It's been torture. Better than you know, Nabokov's Paris Review interview. Way better. <laughs> uh, so I, you know, I'm personally interested in like writing and fiction about like work and jobs, and like that's something I think is really neat. What a bad adjective. A really neat part of the novel. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's sort of gone unrecognized from what I've seen in like uh, some of the reviews and writing about it. Like, um, you know, from like the work of like parenting, obviously, and then also one of the kids grows up to be sort of Zuckerberg-ish. <laughs> and then also, you know, sort of more, not quite blue collar, but blue collar-ish. Like, um, I'm, I, was it Adam who works, or Nick works at the car dealership? Um, you know, and that's, that's, and even uh, the famed Mike Shasta. <laughs> so I'm just naming characters that have jobs, but my question <laughs> is uh, like, uh, just like how you, I, I'm just curious how you access these characters. Cause it's especially, I think some of the stuff with like the car dealership, it's like so specific. And so I'm curious about just how you approach these characters I think outside of just like their relationships with one another, but their relationships with work and labor, um, whether it's like paid labor, or like the the unpaid labor of, of parenthood. Yeah, I love that too. I really love getting to see people in their domestic spaces and their work spaces and their, you know, like quiet in between spaces. I think it's really informative. And specifically the car dealership, I was um, like, it's never, it's, it's, it's never a good time to go buy a car. I'm just, and I, and I, you know, as you're asking me about it, I know that like when I was writing that, I was thinking about the last time that I bought a car when I went to get my minivan before my third was born. And it started out really great and it ended up with me feeling like a sucker. <laughs> and so I think um, trying to think about the people who work there 
and the, the aims that they have and thinking about my own work experience and the way that you are on the sales floor versus how you are in the break room. And, um, you know, I think like there's a, there's a bit of your, like an important part of your ego with how you perform at work. And, um, and, you know, I wanted to show that, you know, like Nick was good at his job and, um, and he could read people and, um, and maybe he wasn't doing such a great job of that at home. Um, but, uh, and in terms of Jason, uh, who is the Zuckerberg, I mean, very, very Zuckerberg light. Like he has a startup, you know, a small startup in a, <laughs> you know, like he's not, he's not rich or wealthy, but, um, I wanted to show that he, how, um, capable he was and he needs to show people how capable he is and that he's not messed up like his mom and some of his siblings um but yeah I think it's like I think it's the same thing with like sex scenes there's like very important information with seeing people at their at their place of work it's uh getting down to business either <laughs> way <laughs> sorry about that <laughs> good <laughs> uh wonderful answer um so this is the uh the third book released under the roxy and gay books imprint mm -hmm. uh and you you published you know with different publishers across your career like as we said before like starting with you know uh upstart punkish indie press like featherproof and now um this uh you know personal you know persona based imprint but under um what press is this under grove Ro grove that's a good one that's, that's one of one. the best yeah um so i'm just curious like this book in particular you know how, how has how has it been to be sort of uh working with someone who's like known certainly as an editor but you know also even more as like a, a writer herself and also to be like part of this like young imprint and anything else that's uh, particular about the publishing process with this latest novel. Um, well, Roxanne personally edited the novel and we have worked together before we knew, know each other and, um, and she reached out and asked if I had any books, which is why she published Hot Springs Drive. Um, and <clears throat> so I was I was used to working with her in a way, um, but it was really cool to kind of be in the first launch, the first year, because she puts out, Roxanne Gay Books is going to put out three books a year. It was cool to be the third book um, and, to, you know, to be in that initial first launch. Um, and I I was pleasantly surprised. By, oh, I mean, it's been it's been six years since I had put a novel out, so things have changed, I'm sure. But I, I felt like the publicity department at um, at Grove, which is who supports Roxanne Gay Books, um, was like really um, locked in and a delight to work with and excited. And Roxanne is personal friends with Chip Kidd. So she just said, hey, can you do the cover to this book? And Chip Kidd did the cover. Um, so I don't know. I, I feel really supported i feel really excited i love working with grove i love working with roxanne um it is this big experiment to see i mean zando's doing it um zando's a, a a publishing company that is privately funded and they have they partner with certain influencers like sarah jessica parker and gillian flynn and crooked media and they have those people have their own imprints and then they you know, put their books out and they publicize them. And it's a big, in, it, it's a big experiment right now to see if that will lead to book sales. Um, and I think Roxanne Gay Books is another example of that. Um, although she herself is a writer, so it's a little different. Um, Gillian Flynn's a writer, but um, yeah. So who knows, who knows if it's, if it's working or not, it's hard to tell. Oh, it is. I mean, look at these people, it's working <laughs> on them. I'm just going to check our time. Um, I'll ask like one more question and then we'll see if we have any audience cues. Um, I had a good one, but I don't remember what it was. Uh, so what what books do you think, you know, it, you always get asked like questions that are the variation of like name a book you read once, like name your favorite book or like name the book that uh, you ripped off or whatever. 
Uh, I mean, no, no one actually asked that, but they should ask that. I mean, I've had a, I've had answers for that, but they're like, you didn't rip that. That book is actually good. Why would how how did you rip that off? Um, but I'm I'm curious, like, what since since this is like kind of a, a new genre for you, and obviously it's influenced by things outside of the realm of literature. Um, but like, what do you what do you think of like what are the books that like are uh, an influencer like a uh, book talker or uh, Sarah Jessica Parker they would like they wouldn't read the books but whoever like is in charge of like curating their books for them like what would be the books you'd want Hot Springs Drive to be like in the stack of the immaculately arranged Instagram post so like what what books is Hot Springs Drive a sibling to you or like what what um what books are in conversation with it oh god okay this is like when um like your agent's like and what comps can you tell me like what's this book like what is this book you know com what is its comps so we can market it I'm really bad at that but I I can think of like books that in influenced me as I was writing this and I know I've talked about this before but um Empty Theater by Jack Gems is um a historical novel about um King Ludwig II and Empress Sissy, the Queen of Austria. Is it the Queen of Austria? It's got a very long title. It's so charming. And um, she did years and years of research. It was originally 500,000 words or something insane like that. And she whittled it, whittled it down to what it is now. Um, and it's alternating points of view. It also starts with um, a death. And uh, I don't know, I found some permissions in that book some important permissions as I was revising Hot Springs Drive. Um, and I also, o, o Caledonia by Elspeth Barker, who's, um, it's um, have, you, have you read it? O, o Caledonia by Elspeth Barker? Oh, I wonder, do you guys, do you think you have it? You should get it if they have it. It's excellent. Um, and it also starts with a, a gorgeously described corpse. <laughs> and that helped me as well sort of locate myself in in the revisions um I think my actual comps that they put in the marketing was like Celeste Ng and I've read a couple of her books I like her books um and I love I'm now I'm just going to name people I love I love um Claire Fuller I love Tana French they both I mean Tana French obviously writes crime Claire Fuller has like more of a sinister under like undercurrent of crime in her novels, um, which which I really love. Um, and A.M. Holmes, and I'm just going to name people I love. <laughs> it's Graham McRae Burton, I think his name is. Barton, Graham McRae. He's a Scottish writer, I believe. And his last novel was called Case Study. And that is a unhinged, unreliable, at times unlikable um narrator that is a delight to read also has crime going through it beautiful beautiful answer and it would make a beautiful spread on a book talkers post if there's any book talkers in the audience um so i, I think we can turn it over to the audience if they have any cues to offer so don't be shy now yeah That's, I mean, I think about that question all the time. I love true crime and there's a lot of bad true crime out there. And I would say Dateline NBC, as much as I love Keith Morrison, I love him so much and there's a character in there based on him, is the kind of formulaic tripe that you go to for, you know, when you need to saute something or, you know, you can't sleep. Um, but there are really good um, true crime podcasts and um, some documentaries that are um, going a little deeper and pushing beyond those sorts of um stereotypes and formulas and um and and what i like about them is that they don't offer you any sort of answer any sort of tidy conclusion that they kind they leave you with these lingering questions and i think that's that there are some dateline episodes that do that for me including secrets on hot springs drive um but uh i i was talking about this with the author kate brody um i think yesterday for my podcast, I'm a writer, but, and um, she has a, a new novel that came out and it's, and it's a crime novel and it's on Soho crime. So it's being marketed that way as well. And we were talking about the human impulse toward true crime and how um, as writers, 
we try to examine it. As women, we try to examine it. And there are noble reasons like, oh, you know, we're, we're exploring all types of humanity and all types of light and dark. And But there's also this other t kind of humanity that we writers and we women also have, which is the urge to look and to see and to and to keep looking and to stare and for no no noble reason other than we just want to see right and so um i think it's i think it's a constant struggle to you know and and not a struggle i'm not struggling but to kind of question your your motivations when you're um seeking something like that out and 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 ask yourself what you're getting from it um but you know, there's, there's, there's more and more good ones out there. Um, I always recommend the Ballad of Billy Balls. If anyone's heard of that podcast, um, which is probably my favorite true crime podcast. It's kind of about a crime, but it's also kind of about a mother, a complicated mother. Um, and it's those kinds of podcasts where you're, or, or documentaries where you're, you're getting a glimpse into the whole of that person's humanity versus this horrible thing um that happened to an undeserving you know victim does that answer your question wonderful answer a plus yes i so i'm bad at titles i'm 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 just i'm bad at titles and to like hype myself up one day, I think I was like 50,000 words in or something, just like in huge 72 point font, I just wrote Hot Springs Drive on the, you know, the first page of the manuscript and I never changed it. And when I sent it to Roxanne, um, I, I didn't change it and I just thought there would be time and, um, but it, I really liked the title and she loved the title and we just never changed it. So it worked. I felt really like energized, like, oh, this novel's real now. Any further questions from our audience? Uh, yes, the... Uh, oh, okay. We go way back, way, way back. Luke, okay, Luke um, came on my podcast, I'm a Writer Butt, and for Heart of Junk. And um, this was back when I had a co-host, Alex Higley. And it was the most fun podcast experience I'd ever had. He's just, I'm a huge fan. He, I, I everything he makes we buy immediately he's just like there's no one that has a mind like yours um yeah we don't have to make it about me this is your night here uh, i felt like I, I i honestly felt like at the end of that episode i was like man luke's embarrassed he had to come on our podcast because <laughs> he's I, too cool i think i proclaimed it during the podcast their best episode and you were right go listen to it it's chock full of goodness I don't think any episode since has, you know, there's been high highs, but some highs are way up there. We've never gotten to that level ever again. I was just, I was, I was on rare form that night. Most of the time, as we can tell, I'm not that What great. do you think it was? What was it about that night? Um, just the raw, the raw energy of uh, the podcast adrenaline kicking in. Yeah, I think there was just a lot of giggling on my part. That, and yeah just like letting you go it was good it was really good please listen to it it's well worth it uh this is further questions of i feel like that was good was okay. that all right yeah thank you so much for coming and listening <laughs> thank you luke and thank you boswell